which is not very, doesn't give people significant self-esteem and uh, you know, confidence to this where the lady here is, um, you know, kind of using almost, almost, whoops, almost proud of, uh, almost proud of this, you know, um, and um, uh, we've had a couple of discussions over the last couple of days about uh, scoliosis and spine curvature and this is the Scott's current project um, and actually let me uh, so this this is uh, what he's kind of working with um, let me see if I can actually find That, oops, lost it. That is a scoliosis brace. That's what he's kind of working with. Imagining, imagine giving something like that to a 14 year old uh, girl. And so this was his motivation because you know, if somebody, if she, you know, if I had my daughters at, at that age, if they were asked to wear something like this, I'm sure that they wouldn't. You know, and if they, if they did, they would be severely traumatized um, psychologically. You know, if they're going out to school and things like that, wearing something like this. But, you know, compare that to, um, to this. Let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it a bit easier so this is actually forming the same uh, function so we looked at the if you look consider the exoskeleton it's got um, spring devices in there essentially uh, using the uh, the elasticity of the nylon during the in, in, in uh, the um, 3d printing process creating long deformable pathways which essentially is what a spring is so you can create quite uh, significant elasticity within uh, the 3d printing process and so he's making taking advantage of that and the fact that you can control the uh, the elasticity by changing the amount of um, uh, den the density of the material and the directionality in which all of these springs go. So if you can look at this a little closer, you'll see that there are some solid regions which are essentially stiffening, which gives you the support, and then elastic regions where the person can move uh, naturally. And so, uh, uh, but that spring uh, pressure is helping to push the uh, the spine into a straighter uh, a, a straighter mode. Every condition will be somewhat different. You know the uniqueness again. So this has to be designed specifically for this patient. The previous design, you it's by adjustments you know you adjust just a strap here you adjust the spring spring strength there and you get that that uh, bracing effect here because you don't need to adjust it it's because it's designed or you don't need to adjust it because it is designed in a way that uh, is specific for this individual so the force it's already adjusted it's pre-adjusted if you like okay now, it, it doesn't work for all scoliosis conditions. There's a thing called the Cobb angle, which basically defines the amount of curvature in the spine. 
Um, it's not a very precise measurement, but it's a way to determine the severity of the condition. Um, these kinds of braces are designed for low cob angle, i.e. not very deformed uh, conditions. Um, I showed a couple of examples of the work that I, uh, some of the work that I'd done in con with a, a spine surgeon uh, where you put these rods into the spine, you actually surgically implant them as a way to really force the spine and to support the spine during its remodeling process. Um, that, that's not what these braces are, are designed to replace. Currently, there is no better solution uh, for severe cob angle uh, correction other than surgery. And um, there, but there are even there methods that we're working on. Um, uh, for example, there's a lot of effort in the use of shape memory alloy uh, to uh, provide that, um, that the, the straightening strength. So building the rods from an SMA, which basically are, are set in one condition at one temperature, but then when you have it at room temperature, it is apply, it's trying to straighten out, which is then applying that force onto the spine. So these things are extremely complicated problems. Um, this in, even this, I think, is a pretty complicated problem. You cannot design this kind of brace, this kind of jacket, uh, without significant consultation with a clinical specialist in uh, scoliosis. So, you know, I mentioned previously about people doing stuff that maybe isn't um, sort of verified and ratified by um, medical councils and the like, um, that's not the case here. That all of these designs are then um, were, uh, performed and created in conjunction with clinical specialists. Anyhow, looks like most people are here now. So let's get on. Because I know some of you, quite a few of you are kind of waiting. Oh, let's get rid of him. Bye-bye, Scott. Oh, just, yeah, show you that one as well. These are some of the other examples. Um, it's kind of, I, 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 it's not, not, doesn't work very well if I show these, uh, these slides in the wrong order. Um, but I, the, the intention of this slide was to say, okay, you've got three images here. Are you able to, to work out what the uh, similarity between them is? And obviously, you know. <laughs> but uh, I just kind of wondered whether when you look at this, if you were to look at this at the first time, would the first thing you would consider is that all of these people have an artificial limb? And that's Scott's intention, really, to divert you away from the obvious which is what a lot of designers uh, try to do, and to, to bring you into another, uh, another viewpoint. You, know, you don't have to think about, you, know, you might look at this one and say, oh, that's a nice bike. Or you say, this is a pretty lady, or this guy's playing football, without realizing that this is an artificial leg, this is an artificial leg, and this is an artificial leg. Anyhow, OK. Now let's get rid of them. Uh, yes, and I'll save that. Okay. Oh, I'll get rid of that one as well. Uh, oh, never mind. Uh, right. What I wanted to do was, oops, come across here. All right. Bioprinting. So I'm, although I've I've worked in this domain. I work in this is, as an engineer. Okay, so it's important for people to, for me to understand what people need um, in this domain, but uh, a lot of the complexities, particularly around the biochemistry, I can only describe in layman's terms. 
All right, so this is my disclaimer at this stage. All right, I've got a, I know, I know, I know a lot about additive manufacturing. What I don't know a lot about is tissue engineering or bioprinting, if you want, in this context. Somebody who knows a lot more about it is a good friend of mine. His name's uh, David Prowell. Um, and um, in fact, he's uh, so he's a, a Colorado State University, um, and I'm actually quite proud of the relationship with uh, David. Uh, I was at a conference. Dave Prowell is a friend of Terry Wohler's, and he's a computer scientist by by uh, profession. <clears throat> Made a lot of money in the early days developing software tools and uh, spends a lot of time talking to people about uh, software uh, security. And he came along to a conference with, with Terry uh, in Portugal, mainly because he likes Portuguese wine. And uh, so I, I, I was talking to him and he was sort of saying, all right, uh, you know, he, he's, he's very interested in all of this. He, he, he knows a lot about what Terry does. Um, and he said, you know, and he, he said he'd come to a conference like this, and he says, it makes you want to go back to school and study for a PhD. And he was about uh, 50s, mid-50s mid, mid at that time. And I says, well, why, why don't you? And he said, well, you know, I'm too old for that. I, you know, why should I want to do this as well? Yeah, I said, uh, you know, that's, that's not a good reason, not a good excuse. Why don't you actually... Uh, uh, get a PhD. So I actually encouraged him to do a PhD. He did it. He then, uh, in the process of doing his PhD, he set up a lab in Co uh, Colorado State University. He got a uh, faculty position pretty much straight away, um, and he's been spending the rest of his life, the remainder of, uh, of that time, working in this area of bioprinting. So, uh, yeah, I kind of feel that, you know, I had some input on that. I'm quite happy with that. Um, very smart guy. <clears throat> so this presentation is an adaptation of a presentation that he gave, and I uh, asked if I could, uh, I could borrow it and uh, use it, and he said, yes, not a problem. Um, uh, so it, it really hopefully addresses a number of the issues around bioprinting, tissue engineering. Um, and it reflects a lot about, in some ways, about what I've been telling you uh, in recent, um, in, in the last couple of days, that at the moment, bioprinting, the majority of bioprinting is not focused on printing organs for implantation. Okay, there's a lot of speculation and there's a lot of effort being devoted to achieving that, but the majority of it is more in this kind of space, um, research. So the need for surrogate tissues, the need for artificial, if you like, tissues, artificially generated, not harvested from humans uh, for research development and testing. When you do work in this space, you find yourself having to work on the bioactivity of the work, you know, of the, the materials and um, systems, drugs, etc., that you're working with. So you can do animal testing. But we all know, I mean, that animal testing isn't necessarily the same as human testing. There's also a lot of issues around animal rights. Um, and therefore, if you want to do animal testing, you really have to justify to the nth degree that it's the only or the best way to do that kind of test. So there's a lot of pressure to try and create other means for doing all of this testing. And so this is where the majority of effort currently is located. Some of it is just in a sort of a 
a self-fulfilling purpose that you're doing test models in order to understand how the cells grow so that you can then eventually create the tissues that are, 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 are suitable for implantation. So it's sort of like, uh, in this case, a product design process, you know, an iterative process. You know, if you want to make parts, uh, you want to design something, you've got to iterate on that until you come up with something that you're satisfied with, you know, from all of your uh, specifications and objectives. It's the same thing here. You want to make a tissue, you find that it's not got the, the right um, uh, uh, formation, so you make it again. It's not got the right uh, complex structures, so you'd make it again. So you work on how to adapt and, and develop these tissues. So development and testing. Live subjects are expensive and difficult, uh, complicated in terms of the approvals and uh, et cetera. And obviously, you know, if you want to do experimentation on live subjects, you've got to think about the welfare of who it is that you're experimenting on, okay? Um, so this is where a lot of the scaffolds that we keep referring to are, uh, are being used as test subjects, sort of like a lab-based experiment. So very Frankenstein-y. Um, having said that, there's a lot of different uh, directions in wh where people are, are going. Um, and so um, we mention uh, about the ASTM standards that I've uh, mentioned a couple of times and I said that there's quite a lot of discussion on terminology. So it's not just about the terminology of what the 3D printers should be called, it's also in terms of the domain in which these printers are being used. So these are some of the terminologies that are appropriate to uh, the area of bioprinting. So we recognize some of them, photopolymerization, binder jetting, powder fusion and sintering, inkjet printing. But then we also note that within the ASTM definitions, there's also a reference to cell, and t cell tissue and organ printing, okay, to scaffolds and to bioinks. So these things are all uh, within that realm as well. So bear that in mind that ASTM is not just about the technologies, but also in terms of the domains in which those technologies are being applied. So I can imagine if I wanted to do a similar thing for aerospace, I would probably see quite a lot of uh, terminologies there which are appropriate to aerospace, which ASTM uh, uh, understand, either through other definitions and other, other domains, uh, sorry, um, other, other standards. Okay, um, another one at the top there, which I haven't mentioned yet, viscosity printing. So um, this really relates very heavily to the bioprinting domain because we are very often using bio inks. So one of the things we might sort of look at is what is a bio ink. Um, another thing to bear in mind is, is that a lot of this have actually um, come from this sort of original um, low cost. So <laughs> it's funny, you know, uh, medical uh, research is probably the most important research that we can do on the planet, but it's very commonly not done because it's not very well funded. So um, it, it's interesting to say that we have much more we, we put much more importance on, uh, on, on weapons research and uh, destroying people and planets, less, uh, less importance on trying to uh, treat the organisms which are uh, resident on that planet. But that's just me speaking, okay? All right, I'm on record as saying this, all right? So uh, I don't know if I'll ever get to be a politician. Um, 
but uh, one of the things, again, I relate to this thing about technology convergence and the fact that technologies now are so much easier to access and so much cheaper, this is having a significant impact in the research domain. Okay, so you guys have never had it so good. You know, if I go back to when I was doing my research, when I was doing robotics, and I wanted to, and, and I, you know, I spent a lot of time building end effectors on industrial robots. And I would design these things, I would draw them out uh, by hand because we didn't have CAD systems. I would then have significant and lengthy discussions with the technician as he tried to understand my drawings. Um, he would then start to essentially build my design, but keep coming back to me to check, is this what you actually wanted? So that we could uh, ensure that he didn't make too many mistakes. Um, and then I would eventually, and then I'd build and equip it with the sensors and the cameras that I had and carry out my research. So one iteration on my design probably cost me a month, maybe more, okay? Because this guy was also very busy with other, other things. Now, if I want to iterate my research, if I want to build end defectors, I can do it within a day or so, okay? Even in doing the design and everything. And it's largely because of this guy here, or this item here. This is the original RepRap machine, it's referred to as Darwin 1, okay? Um, Adrian Bowyer, the inventor of this thing, he always, his vision was um, what was called a von Neumann machine. Anybody understand what's m meant by a von Neumann machine? No? Okay, you know John von Neumann, okay, so he's a German mathematician, yes? All right, so he had this idea and actually proved it somehow, I don't know how, that it was possible for a machine to replicate itself and in the process improve itself. Okay, so it's sort of like an artificial evolution. And uh, so the concepts there were about, you know, tolerances and uh, precision. So the, what he was saying is, is that it should be possible for a machine to create something which would have a higher tolerance than it itself was uh, functioning at. Okay, interesting concept, worth looking up. So this is sort of, that's why our, uh, Adrian called this the Darwin machine, okay, because he basically is saying it's a sort of a crossover. And, and if you look at it, the reason behind why he was calling it the Darwin machine, you look at a lot of these components here, and you actually look at a lot of 3D printers today, you'll see that a lot of the components on the machines themselves are actually 3D printed. And that's what he was trying to say, that 3D printers could print themselves, okay? And that also led into research into things like bioinks. But before bioinks, it was also leading into research and it's the sort of stuff that you're doing where you're making and 3D printing sensors and actuators. Because, yeah, you can make the, mech the devices and maybe uh, sort of the structure and the mechanical mechanisms quite easily on a 3D printer, but what about the other aspects, the, uh, uh, the device, the, the, the sensors and the actuators? So a lot of people are then also dri driven in that direction, and it'd be quite interesting for people to, to look at that too, if you wish, as a research direction. I think it's a great one. What is this? form of um, not just embedding sensors 
into structures using 3D printing, but also creating those sensors and devices within the 3D printing. Eventually, this is going to happen. It's just a matter of being able to understand and be able to manipulate a sufficient number of materials. Okay. Um, if you look up on the websites, uh, you look at also uh, a variation of uh, RepRap called uh, Fab at Home, F-A-B at Home. Um, another at home. Uh, this was um, a project which was initiated at Cornell University in the US, uh, particularly uh, Professor Hod Lipson, who is uh, quite uh, quite well known in this that's this arena as well. Hod Lipson. Um, if you look at some of the early work on there, you'll actually see that they've been able to build some actuators. There's a very interesting um, video uh, where he used the Fab at Home to build uh, a battery. So not only sensors, actuators, but also energy sources. So it's possible. It's not a very nice battery and it's not a very powerful battery but it is a battery. So long as you can make the, you know, the, the, somehow deliver the materials, so you just have to de deliver some materials which are, react together and create electricity. Okay, anyhow. Sorry, say again. What type of lithium ion battery? No, it's a silver nitride battery. And uh, what it is, if you look at it, what he, so you have to put the battery in a casing. So he had the fab at home extruding. Uh, so he, he mainly used a silicon, uh, silicon rubber, uh, air cure. So he used to extrude that, and that would create the casing. And then what he would do is he would uh, de deposit um, layers of uh, silver nitride paste which then cr would be sufficient to sort of create a um, uh, current. It, it's a concept, okay? Um, I suppose you could do probably the most sensible would be what's the, the LIFEPO batteries, lithium potassium iron uh, batteries. Um, those are the, probably the most likely uh, ways to create batteries using 3D printing, I think, because you've got more control over the materials. Anyway, I'm digressing again. Um, the, the Darwin machine has itself evolved into machines like this. So this is, if you are in that sort of... Um, uh, bioengineering and you're wanting to look at uh, uh, 3D printing, tissue engineering, then these are the, the kind of printers that you might like to consider. Um, when I started looking at this, there were no printers which were dedicated towards um, uh, medical, so we built our own. Uh, but quite quickly there came... Um, the bio plotter from a German company. It's got something tech in its name. Envision Tech. So Envision Tech also do uh, DLP machines, but they also did a machine called the bio plotter. And uh, that's actually very similar to this one. This is the Regen Who uh, machine. 
Um, basically, if you look at this, you can see a lot of uh, features which are quite useful in, um, in the bio uh, plotter thing. Let's just go back a minute to this one. This one is from Cell Inc. Um, it's a little unclear as to how this works and what, it, uh, what functionality it has. But if you look at this one, you can see there's a lot of features in here. Um, first off, in bioprinting, it's not necessary to have a machine which is really big. Okay? Nobody at the moment is very interested in creating large uh, scaffold and uh, cellular structures. Most of the samples and things that you want to create are like a centimeter cubed. Okay, so that's the first thing. So you don't need a big machine. Um, secondly, you don't need a very accurate machine either. Um, so the drive systems and things are not that critical. Um, in this case, you can see the drive systems are actually pretty good. You know, you've got a you've got a, a couple of linear pathways here, which are quite um, uh, quite effective. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I so we get that way movement, and we get that way movement, and we get that way movement. So it's three axis that way. Um, another thing to really bear in mind is that the uh, when I talk about not having a large platform, in particular, you don't really need much uh, Z movement, vertical movement, because quite often you're just making, uh, say, things which are very, very small in height. You may find that you want to uh, do a lot of these in some kind of uh, biochemistry assay, you know, a sequence of experiments, and therefore you might have a number of cells that you want to work with, and so. X and Y is probably more important to have a bit bigger than in Z. Um, what is quite important is that you want to be able to deliver more than one material. So you can see here multiple heads. This is very common on a bioprinter. So having four heads, having a carousel system where you can collect the heads and deliver them. Um, that's uh, a uh, uh, very common. However, the material delivery, you see, it's not con not necessarily continuous. These uh, are probably pneumatic uh, tubing, not material delivery tubing. This is most likely. So you can see here, there's a colored ink in here. This is not colored. So what's, what you're doing is actually just delivering some pressure to feed a syringe. So most commonly is, is that the material delivery is, is constrained by the volume of the syringe. Okay? So you don't need large amounts of materials. Say you're building small samples. Probably those materials are very difficult to formulate. You know, because they could be uh, in all sorts of... Um, you know, uh, chemical sequences. Um, where, who was I talking to uh, yesterday? Who are the, where's the, the, the bioengineers? Sitting at the back, is it? Where, 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 where? Lost them. I uh, don't seem to be here at the moment. Um, the, uh, they were asking me about, you know, what's the best kind of scaffold and things to, uh, to work on. And we were then discussing about scaffolds and the fact that, you know, it's, it's, well, you know, bio, they were talking about bio inks and preparation of bio inks with scaffolds. And it, it, what we realized and what we discussed was it's usually a very lengthy sequence of steps. When you build a scaffold, probably the first thing that you do is actually you then uh, pre uh, work on the scaffold by cutting it up. Um, if you are using a, if you're building a scaffold, you probably build it like this, 
for one layer, and then on top of it, you'll build another layer. Okay, and then you've got sort of areas which are your volume space. <laughs> anyway, um, if you notice, at the end, you've got these sealed off areas because you're doing a continuous extrusion. So the first thing that most biochemists do to the scaffold is cut, 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 and cut in order to expose more uh, space to, for, in the scaffold. Of course, you could sort of go print, stop, print, stop, and nowadays that's uh, a reasonably reliable approach now. Um, but uh, in, even w w if you do that and you're playing around with the scaffold materials, you'll get stringing effects and things like that, which is not desirable. So, sorry, was there a question? That's what I've just said. That's what I just said. You can. And nowadays, the machines are better and more reliable, and therefore it's more possible. But if you're working with a material that you do not, that you've not fully characterized, that you're extruding, so maybe you're working on the scaffold material itself, then when you stop, sometimes you'll get stringing. Okay? So you may end up with a bit of a mess. Okay? So. If, you're, if your build process is relatively reliable, then yes, you can. But even then, if you've noticed when you stop, you usually get a swelling, yes? So if you get a swelling, you may still end up with a closing off of those pores. So, yeah, people are improving the technology all the time. Uh, there's now ways to even control the swelling effects by doing a... Uh, uh, a, uh, a suction technique at the end, um, it is possible. Uh, you name it. This is one of the points we're going to be make. I'm going to talk about. There's all sorts of materials uh, for these scaffolds. We've already mentioned quite a few of those. Um, uh, when I, the work that I was doing uh, in Singapore, we we concentrated on. Uh, uh, polycaprolactone. Um, a lot of people are using um, uh, polylactides, uh, uh, polyglycolides, PGAs, PLAs, PCLs, blends of all of the, the stuff, um, uh, PLLA, which is uh, quite a common material anyway for 3D printers. Basically, a polymer which is sort of fairly organically uh, constructed is coming from usually from uh, plant-based sources. A lot of these materials are coming from things like um, corn, but then also you can use celluloses. Um, people are working on um, uh, uh, chitosan uh, materials, which essentially come from uh, uh, shellfish uh, sort of um, shells, um, you know, ch uh, chitin, essentially. Um, you can also uh, work with alginates. Um, so these are also plant-based uh, sort of materials. So there's a lot of different materials, and this is one of the areas that a lot of people are focusing on what is the best scaffold material to use. Never mind what a, how does it work with, with cells, you know, um, how does it function uh, when you print it. Okay, so, uh, so what I was basically leading on to in all of this is that there are multiple you, it, it, the type of experiments and the type of um, products that we build with bioprinters usually involve a number of materials. 
and maybe even a number of processes. So it's also quite common to have what you might, uh, a, 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 a version of a hybrid 3D printer. So up to now, we've thought of hybrid 3D printers as additive plus subtractive, yes? Um, here, it's broader than that because it might be additive plus then um, a surface treatment. Um, it may be, uh, which is maybe also additive. So it might be additive plus additive. It might be additive plus um, a uh, chemical uh, exposure. You know, you might um, want to put uh, expose it to UV light or something like that to sort of uh, you know kill the cells or whatever to sterilize it before you do the next next layer. There may be uh, that you are additive, and we saw that with the heart thing, um, where you were actually had a, a, a hydrogel a gel-like structure, and you were printing inside the gel. All of these things are very common in bioprinting experiments. So you ideally want a bioprinter that does that kind of thing. Okay, so, so and a lot of bioprinters now, that's what they do. Um, if you look at this one, this isn't actually a bioprinter. Um, this is just a highly versatile 3D printer. So this one, you've got um, extruders, you've got drill heads, you've got syringe heads. So what you do is you, you play around with your system and you now look at quite a number of uh, 3D printers that are on the market um, it's quite common these days to have a 3D printer where you can swap the head out and put a laser on there and therefore change it from a printer to an engraver or a, or a cutter. You know, a laser cutter, laser engraver, you can also then swap it out and put a drill head on there. So these guys have just gone another couple of steps further by basically coming up with a variety of different heads some of these are, might be probes where you can just measure stuff uh, using the printer. So you can do uh, like a coordinate measurement machine type device. Um, this one, quite clearly, this is a syringe. This is the syringe holder. So you've got a little stepper motor drive system to drive the syringe to give a constant pressure or constant output. Um, there's probably some other stuff in there, um, uh, maybe a camera, you know, all sorts of things that you could mount on a structure like this. This is not something that just is appropriate for a 3D printer. It can be all sorts of other uh, devices as well. Um, it could be a tape layer. I've seen some of those where you get a, uh, you can lay down conductive tapes and therefore make uh, PCB type um, uh, devices. Uh, so this again leads on to embedding uh, sort of uh, electronics and actuators in there. So there's all sorts of things you can do with your, your printer. And so a lot of the bio printer guys are, are buying machines like this because it's uh, something they, they can uh, easily use. I mean, I think the most important thing for bioprinting is, well, the most, two most important things. One is uh, a, a conventional heat-based melt extrusion system for laying down uh, usually low temperature or relatively low temperature polymers like uh, PLAs. Um, but then uh, the other thing is a syringe-based uh, delivery system. And then the other major advantage is the ability to switch between 
different uh, delivery modes. So either, either a, a carousel type thing where you pick up the head or you actually have multiple heads itself. So this is a carousel based. Uh, the previous one was a multiple head system. Oh, I, I have no idea with this machine, but I imagine it is, yes. And again, if you've got a hotbed, you don't have to use it, do you? If you haven't got a hotbed, then you haven't got a hotbed. <laughs> so it, it really doesn't, you know, I mean, I don't know for this machine. I'm not that familiar with it. Uh, right. For the types of materials they tend to use, um, they do not look to do the uh, liquid to solid transformation quite so rapidly. So there are, for example, um, uh, hydrogels which you dry out and they create a foam, solid foam. Yeah. Uh, you don't do that in, inside the machine. The usual practice is you create the structure and then you put it into a drying oven. Sure. That's why you have a bio, bio lab, isn't it? Contamination is a problem. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> sure, yeah. Contamination is always a problem, but um, that's your life, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you have lab facilities and you have protocols and all your training is about largely about avoiding contamination, isn't it? So why is this a particular problem when you're doing this all the time? Aha, now we're getting to it, okay? So this is why you're not a bio lab, because you because you don't really understand about protocols to maintain contaminants. Where are our biochemists, bioengineers? Yeah, so you can talk. Yeah, advise him on the best ways to avoid contaminations. Okay, yes. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I'm making fun of you, but the point is, is that. Yes, you're right. Contamination can be a problem. Uh, it's always a problem. Um, you can either, yes, have a delivery system in here which dries the scaffold out in situ, and maybe, yes, that does help. Um, but there are other ways. And, in, and quite often, in fact, a lot of the drying methods don't actually involve ovens and stuff like that. They use quite often involve, you know, immersion into uh, weak acid solutions and things like that um, to sort of more co cause a cross-linking effect rather than a drying effect. Um, and then you dry out afterwards. So there's, again, there's a lot of different stages. One of the things that I learned from working, so I mean, I've had biochemists working for me in the area of tissue engineering. And the thing is, is that, you know, a lot of these, once I give them a scaffold, that's only the start of their their work and they spend a load of time I mentioned about trimming off the the scaffolds um, another thing is um, quite often you etch the scaffolds so you might uh, immerse into a week's um, acid solution and that gives you a surface texture which then will allow you your coatings to be applied the coatings are usually uh, sort of an inorganic or um, non-bioactive uh, coating because it's sort of like an interface between the scaffold and then the, uh, the active components like um, uh, proteins, like bone morphogenic proteins. Uh, uh, you know, um, even then there might be sugar coatings, which I was mentioning to you before, the use of heparin sulfate. As a, as a way to help those BMPs stay where they are. So, and then, then you apply cells, okay? And sometimes with the cells, you're putting other stuff like um, 
like, like heparin itself with, to help with the, the regenerative processes. So there's a lot of materials and a lot of different steps. And then that's it, you build your scaffolds, but then you do a, another set of uh, experiments and to, to identify the cells. You know, you do all these ELISA tests and things like that, I mean, which are basically then identifying whether you've got living cells or dead cells, uh, how many they are, whether they've integrated, and you do those over a number of days to uh, then plot the growth uh, coefficients. So it's, it's complicated, all right? So if contamination, moving it, your part from the machine to somewhere else is a major problem, you're only on the start of the journey, okay? next uh, yeah so um, there's sort of like three approaches if you like or generic approaches towards uh, tissue engineering um, the uh, some of these sort of relate to oh, so so the, so the three classics are uh, biomimicry. I think you understand about biomimicry. Yeah, you basically want to replicate some of the some of the um, features of, um, of of a biological system. When, when it says not functioning, this form, fit, shape, to me is also a bit to do with function. Um, for example, um, we did some work in one of our design labs uh, using, um, I think, I'm trying to think what animal that we were trying to replicate. Basically trying to create a, um, a low friction surface, which would then go on the bottom of um, skis. For, for skiers. So uh, if you know how skis kind of work, you basically try to um, sort of you know, create a low friction uh, between the, the, um, the snow and the, the ski. Essentially the compression actually causes the snow to melt slightly and that causes a lubrication layer which gives you the, uh, the, sl the sliding effect. Um, uh, this could be more efficient if the surface itself was low friction. So, uh, so we were looking at some animal designs and trying to recreate the shape of those, the animal skin, um, on the base of the ski. And um, it didn't really work very well, but we uh, we, we tried. Um, that is biomimicry. So this is kind of like what, he, what Dave means by not functioning is that um, it, it doesn't, it's not grown there. It's not grown into that shape. It's, it's replicated using a, a conventional manufacturing method. We see a lot of these things, you know, there's now a lot of st st uh, sticky type of gripping type devices which are based around um, the use of uh, like, like uh, newts and geckos and things like that, where uh, a gecko actually climbs up a wall, not because he's creating suction, but because he's, he or she, it is creating electrostatic force uh, attraction because there's lots of very fine hairs on, the ba on, on, the, uh, on, on their, their, their feet. And so that allow that gives you the, the traction. Anybody seen Mission Impossible 4? Yeah, where the guy climbs up the side of the uh, uh, the Burj Khalifa in uh, Dubai. Every time I watch that, I get vertigo. Um, but yeah, that's the, the gloves that he supposedly wear are sort of electrostatic gloves, aren't they? Where you sort of slap on and then peel off. And that's basically how a lot of uh, 
a lot of these kinds of devices work, and uh, that's a biomimicry type of thing. Um, Velcro is probably one of the first biomimicry um, products uh, that most, uh, well, so probably one of the most that was sort of kind of explicitly labeled as biomimicry because the guy that invented Velcro saw that um, some of these plant um, seeds uh, clung to fabric and the, the backs of animals and things like that as a way of uh, plant uh, dispersion. Uh, and it was because there's this little sort of hook mechanism. So, so that's kind of what we mean by biomimicry and that's what we mean by we build it. We sort of understand the biomimicry uh, effect and what it's supposed to achieve and therefore build a device which has a similar effect. Um, the, if you, anybody is a swimmer, uh, follows the Olympics, uh, the, uh, the shark suit that was uh, banned from the Olympics uh, that the Australian swimmers wore, that's the same sort of thing. It basically creates micro turbulence. It's a textured surface. Everybody thinks that the best way to swim through water is to be as smooth as possible until they found out that if you had a slight texture creating micro vortices, then that creates a skin around you which allows you to go through the water quicker. So those kinds of things, understanding how nature has solved lots of uh, uh, problems uh, in, in uh, evolution. Um, okay, uh, autonomous self-assembly this is sort of like saying, okay, providing um, a, uh, uh, a mechanism for cells to uh, build, them cell, build into multicellular and complex structures. Uh, so this is where a lot of the work is. This is where scaffolds live, okay? Physical and chemical processes of tissue and organ development. In the last 10 minutes I've talked to you and mentioned about how when you've got a scaffold how that leads eventually to a cellular structure you know and it's a multi-stage process it's complicated um, it's uh, tedious um, it's prone to error and when you've got as you increase the number of variables, you increase the number of options. So a lot of, uh, a lot of experimentation needs to be done, a lot of design of experimentation needs to be done in order to you know, work your way through that minefield of options to come up with the best combination. And it also depends on your application. If you're wanting to make um, uh, uh, bones for experimentation then uh, you, your scaffolds don't have to be too complicated. If you want to make bones for implantation then you have to think about the directionality of the bone, the trabecular structure of the bone, the fact that bones aren't a uh, homogeneous structure, not even within the specific bone uh, sort of segments. So cortical bone is not homogeneous either, certainly not in load-bearing conditions. You need to have that sort of fibrous structure. If you look at uh, you know, a, a branch of a tree, it's the same sort of thing. The fibers go lengthways. That helps with vascularization and uh, uh, delivery of nutrients, etc. But it also um, allows you, gives you significant tensile uh, strength, which allows for bending. So, you know, if you so you don't have when you when you bend your or apply a, a force which causes bending on your on your your uh, bones, um, they don't fracture. Okay? So, and think about how 
that corresponds to 3D printing. You know, we, you know if you're building a bone with a, a analog with 3D printing, the most likely is you build it exactly the wrong way, wrong way round. Because you probably build it upwards so that you minimize support structures. And then you've got all those layers which are all fracture surfaces potentially. Yeah? So, so yeah, the, these are the areas that we're working in. So, we're basically encouraging the cell to build this uh, itself and providing the most suitable accommodation that we can. Okay? Um, and then organ engineering is essentially taking that one step further and realizing that, you know, this isn't biomimicry. Not really. It's functionality. It's biofunctionality. And so you combine the functionality with the actual structure, then you get organs. Okay. Um, when I was uh, looking um, at... Uh, researching into bone tissue engineering, we spent a lot of time discussing and trying to understand uh, osteochondrial uh, effects, basically joints, cartilage, and bone. Okay? Um, one of the things that we found is, is that we build our scaffolds. Um, as I said, I mentioned we used uh, PCL, polycaprolactone, as the polymer but that's not very bioactive and not very bioinducive. Okay, it's biodegradable and reasonably inert, but it's not going to help too much in cell regeneration. So we used to mix the polycaprolactone with tricalcium phosphate, it's a bone ceramic, or bone analog ceramic. Similar sorts of properties to hydroxyapatite. So, we mix those in, then we used to create our scaffolds, which was essentially a, a composite. Um, now, uh, I mentioned about etching of the scaffold. Well, one of the reasons that we used to etch the scaffold is because when we incorporate the calcium phosphate into the polymer, it goes into the middle of the polymer feed. So you end up with an extrusion you extrude, okay, from the nozzle. So here's the nozzle. Here's the extrudite. What happens is in, in the nozzle, you'll have particles of, uh, of TCP extruding into the, uh, the molten or being carried by the molten uh, PCL. And because of shear effects, and, tur and shear turbulence in the channel, what you'd have is little micro vortices here, which basically allow you to extrude and provide the extrude. Well, not here, actually, here. <laughs> this is outside of the nozzle. Um, you would uh, not get the particles at the surface of the scaffold. So the TCP might be bioactive, but it's no use because the cells don't see it. The cells won't detect it. So the first thing we would have had to do, and what the first thing we did, is essentially dissolve our scaffold so that the particles are then exposed. And then, so we would have a smaller scaffold. The pore sizes would be bigger. And those would then have the TCP uh, powders there, and the cells would be able to bond with the powders. Um, what was I also going to say? Uh, we've not mentioned the uh, pore sizes very much yet. Um, the scaffolds that we used to generate, we tried to aim for a pore geometry of around about 500 microns, about half a millimeter, um, in, in, in sort of a, oh, 
general uh, dimension, overall dimension. Um, cells, uh, bone cells, around about 50 microns as uh, normally. And so that allows for a, num uh, a population of cells to occupy a pore, but without too much bridging across that pore. And then also a bit of space for nutrients to get there uh, to allow for the cells to, uh, uh, to, to uh, join together um, and, and uh, to, to, to become healthy. Uh, what next? Yes. Um, so, in fact, research is carried on at all levels. I mean, people are working on um, uh, just 3D printing of cells. So this is the bio-ink part. So people are putting cells into syringes and then extruding them. And, uh, you know, because that's a good way of controlling the delivery. Um, and uh, so therefore knowing uh, where those cells are actually going to be. Um, I mentioned about osteochondrial implants and I forgot to mention. So as I said, we build the bone using PCL with TCP. Cartilage doesn't want the, um, the calcium phosphate there. It, it, it doesn't like it. So in there, the most likely is the scaffolds that we were building were uh, PCL scaff uh, material. Um, and then, so what you would quite often have, so if you had a, like a joint, jointed uh, component, say so imagine, uh, whew, okay, Simplest one to remember is probably a femoral head, okay? Okay? So all this would be nice uh, bone around here, and then you'd want cartilage around here. So you've got a cartilage region, and you've got a, a bone region. One could also then subdivide that, that you would have, obviously, uh, cortical bone with trabecular structure, so we make sure that it's all. When people are playing around with um, in the bioreactors with the bone, and then actually putting mechanical stress on the uh, on the cells, um, some using sort of inductive fields, some actually doing mechanical compression of the cellular structures. There's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that's how trabeculae actually form. That if you're actually pushing the cells in a particular direction, they react by growing along that direction. Okay? Um, and then you've got so cancellous bone, spongy bone in, inside here. Okay? Um, certainly around this region, then, you've got a sort of a an interface okay uh, so you've got that interfacial region and um, so what we were also uh, hypothesizing is that probably we could build a scaffold in a 3d printer kind of like that, um, which would give us the sort of bone formation that we want. Um, probably then we'd still have to think about how do we cause it to load, particularly when you've got variable load path. Okay, so this is vertical, this is like this way. Should I then apply a, a force this way and the force this way in order to cause that? But that's that's a long, long way in the future. Um, but what we were then looking at was what, how do we deal with this? So what we were then thinking is, in fact, that we would use curved layer printing so that we print 
normal to the surface with PCL. So that was the kind of kind of um, um, approach that we were considering uh, during that uh, uh, during that time. Does that make sense to people? Maybe. Okay. Uh, what next? Um, yeah, moving into yeah. The, so the cellular components, I suppose, is about I uh, know um, uh, sort of stem cell work, I guess, and getting them to form into different types of cells. Then there's research on actually printing of the cells themselves. Um, then there's the sort of the 3D printing of tissues, and then also people that are trying to 3D print organs. So this is really just to try and say, okay, how does this all turn in from one thing to the other? So there's lots of research going on. So, you know, when whoever it was that asked me, you know, what materials, um, it's very, very subjective uh, thing. There's a lot, a lot of materials. Um, so, there are, I mean, it's some interesting things actually as well. Um, I mentioned about, uh, so this is from Atala, Wake Forest, that I mentioned earlier that did a lot of work on the bladder. And um, if you think about it, this is quite a, a common thing. You know, essentially our geometry is largely defined by our skeleton. Okay? A lot of the other cellular, the soft cell structures, are really defined, could, could be considered as, as, as flat surfaces, then wrapped around that skeleton. So it's a bit like taking a piece of cloth, which has the flexibility, but then sewing it into a three-dimensional structure. The physical support coming from the skeleton. So this, if you think about that, that's what Atalo was realizing with regards to his work on the bladder. In fact, he created bladder tissue, which was flat. And then he just worked out a method to cut it up and sew it together so as it formed a three-dimensional shape and, there, and functioned as a bladder. And he inserted it in pigs and it worked. You know, so he grew a bladder in the lab. Um, from what I understand, the tissue structure is quite straightforward and simple compared to many others. It's not, not a multicellular structure, so that's why he chose it. Um, but then uh, it, was, it was quite easy for him to then uh, create. But it was a great demonstration of what can be done. And the similar thing we can see, you know, if we've got uh, vascular and bronchial tubes in us, you know, airways and uh, blood vessels, then these are tube structures. Also relatively straightforward in their basic structure. The complexity comes from the branching and the size variations. Okay, and therefore it becomes a network type of concept. And I've got, a, I've got one later. Um, but we can deal with this kind of like at this level, if we've got the track here and we can do some kind of, you know, people have talked about stents, for example, and splints and things. That's where that comes from. Okay, um, corneas, kidneys, kidneys then obviously are another dimension above that into much more complex multicellular structures with a lot of branching in there. Uh, lungs would be the same, livers would be the same. Pancreas. What else? Okay, so structural complexity, sort of some idea there about starting off with something relatively simple structure, two-dimensional, which is skin, cartilage, which can then be formed over com more complex uh, geometric forms. Um, tubing structures, vascular, aortic, trachea, and then fully three-dimensional structures, which relates to things like kidneys. 
However, I said skins and that thing is relatively simple, but the reality is again is not. I mean, okay, the ge geometric form might be, we might be able to um, uh, produce a sort of like an epidermal, an epidermal layer, but then to also include other factors in there, including the hair follicles, etc. cetera. Um, and then we're turning what is initially looking like a two-dimensional problem into a highly three-dimensional problem. But this is the kind of level that we're working at at the moment. At the moment, we're really just still playing around with simple three-dimensional structures, um, trying to get good mechanical properties, but then uh, predictable properties, uh, adjustable properties, but even then we look at these, these are not really adjustable yet because we've not changed the density of any of these forms or anything yet. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we end up uh, working with is sort of uh, these sort of cellular structures. So the scaffolds have now been um, uh, infused with cells and other uh, nutrients, etc., and now are creating uh, cellular tissue bone, for example. Um, we could play around with some of these ideas to create the geometry. So yeah, it'd be nice. we're working a lot with just basic prismatic structures, but it is possible to do something similar with conventional 3D printing to create um, uh, uh, more three-dimensional effects, sacrificial processes similar to support structures, etc., which we could apply in contexts like this to create um, a very uh, complex tree-like uh, structure, where like these, these cell uh, scaffolds which are aimed at trying to create lung tissue. Time to break there? Let's break there, okay? We'll carry on from there. I've got a few more on this yet.